Hey guys, it's Ranger Laura Lee, the interpretive intern at Bastrop and Bisher State Park. Right now, we are not in Bastrop or Bisher. We are actually at Enchanted Rock. Today, we're going to be going over some of the primitive campsites. We're going to be hiking over there and showing you what those look like and talking about some of the important things to remember whenever you're preparing to go to them and whenever you're staying there. Um, in addition, we'll be going over Leave No Trace. And this is a perfect example for us right here. This is um, some doggy poo in a doggy bag. Um, not supposed to be here. Um, we have trash cans for that reason. There's actually a trash bin out that way. <laughs> Thinking about backpacking, it is a pack in, pack out. So you're wanting to pack this out and dumping it um, in, the, in the proper areas because we're wanting the trail and the camp areas to stay as pristine, as natural as possible. Fecal matter like this, um, both from humans and animals, get into our rivers and streams um, and they are very bad for your health. They carry different viruses, which can make you really sick whenever you're backpacking and really hard um, to safely get out. So making sure that if you do bring your dog out and you're collecting its poop, you're packing it out and throwing it away. the map to figure out which way we should go. So we're here on the loop trail and there's a cutoff point. The first one that we've come to the scenic view trail and then this one continues down to go to the first primitive camping area. And this right here says it's a scenic overlook. So I would bet since it's the first big marked area where there is a cutoff that that one is this guy right here. So we're standing right here. So as I've mentioned many times before in the other videos that I've done, it's really important to have your map with you. And if you're ever unsure of where you're going, making sure to pull it out and figure out where you're going so you don't get lost and you can have a good trip. LNT or leave no trace is really important when you're in the backcountry because we want to make sure that we respect beautiful areas such as this. And to help introduce all of that, we're going to have Halen Teal, a volunteer and seasoned interpreter, talk about LNT. Hi everyone, I am back at Bisher. I'm a volunteer here at Bisher and Bastrop State Park. My name is Halen. I have a background in national parks, national forests. And I've been working with a nonprofit called Leave No Trace, it's the Center for Outdoor Ethics. And I've been a trainer with them for about 10 years. It's become one of my passion projects. It was based to help backpackers learn how to be good stewards of the environment. Now it was based on backpacking, but it can be used in any place like a state park here at Bisher in the front country campground. Anywhere in public land, Leave No Trace can be applied. And it's really good to learn 
keeps you safe, and it also keeps our environment safe and healthy. Now, it's good to keep in mind, in Texas it's great to learn because many of our park rules and regulations are founded in the same ethics as Leave No Trace. So what I'll do today is give you a really brief crash course, a good overview. Now the first principle we'll talk about today is plan ahead and prepare. And this is exactly what it sounds like. As many of these principles are, you'll notice is it what it sounds like, use your common sense and you can usually kind of determine what it's gonna be about. So when you plan ahead and prepare, it means a few things. And I know that Laura Lee already discussed this in some of the previous videos. You wanna make sure you know where you're going and know before you go. So this means researching the terrain, the climate, what's the weather outlook? Do you need any special equipment for this type of place that you might not normally carry? This also helps you learn the rules and regulations of a place. So you wanna be responsible for those before you go. It would be a big bummer if you were to drive to Big Bend to backpack with your dog 10 hours to realize that they're actually not allowed. So if you research those things ahead of time, you will have a better and safer trip. Another thing to consider is perhaps let someone know where you're going. So give someone your itinerary so they can look after you while you're gone, just in case something happens. If somebody knows where you're at, what dates and times and who you're with, what trail you're on, it can be a lot easier to help you if anything happens to go wrong. Something else she mentioned would be um, experience level you wanna know your experience level and you always wanna to hike to the weakest person in your group. So make sure you're choosing a trail that's good for you. And water, how much water do you need? Do you have to pack it in? Is this somewhere you can filter it or treat it with pills? All of that's good to know ahead of time so you're fully prepared. the first primitive camping area. One thing to keep in mind whenever you're first coming in, a lot of state parks, either the campsites in here are going to be reservable for each one or it's a free-for-all. So making sure um, before you book at a camping area, you know if you have to reserve a spot in advance or you just have to buy a general camping area uh, spot and then you can go in and pick whichever one you want. Hey guys, we made it to the first primitive camping area, Walnut Springs camping area. One thing to keep in mind whenever you're wanting to stay at a primitive camping area is that you need to know in advance if the area is reservable. So um, if you're going in and you're booking just the area generally and you pick your spot once you get here or if each campsite in the primitive area are reservable. So knowing that in advance, on the state park website, you'll be able to see at each camping area what it calls for. In addition to that, knowing that in a lot of primitive camping areas, there aren't bathrooms, there isn't running water, there isn't electricity, um, and you can't have any fires. And some though, there are compostable toilets like this one here, which we can go up and show you in just a second. But just keeping those things in mind for whenever you're packing and making sure you're packing in and packing out and you're prepared for staying in a primitive camping area. Okay, so this marker right here there's a couple of things. First off, it's a WS. Can you guess what that stands for? Walnut Springs. Yes. <laughs> so that is the campsite marker right there. And then 105 is the campsite number. So here at Walnut Springs, all of these campsites are reservable. Um, once again, make sure you check before you go out. Um, if you're reserving a spot or you're reserving an area, you can pick your spot therein. Um, you can see here, this is very clearly an area where people have been setting up tents. And you can tell because there are some nice cleared out areas. And there is pretty flat and level. There aren't too many rocks or stumps to be able to get in your way. And so a tent spot could be right here. Maybe come this way, you clear out some brush. Maybe one over there. Um, online, you'll be able to see how many tents per site and how many people recommend it or require you.
look, there's number 104. So just across the way. fuel system, um, the cooking system that I had shown you before. Um, you want to make sure you have a nice cleared away area where you can make your food and without, you know, um, moving a couple of these twigs to the side, you'll have that for yourself. Another thing to keep in mind um, whenever you're in the back country areas like this is you want to follow the L&T principles like Halen had talked about. Um, and she's actually going to bring up a couple of more things that are specific to backcountry and backpacking in general. The second leave no trace principle is to travel and camp on durable surfaces and this too is exactly what it sounds like. Now this becomes easiest when backpacking because you have a trail most of the time and when you stay on that trail it's made to be a durable surface that does not affect the land around it. There's fragile ecosystems in some places even in Texas that we don't want to disturb by going off trail for any reason unless it's accepted and necessary like to set up camp. One thing you want to be careful of is to not create social trails. These are unofficial trails that people create over time that damage the landscape, create confusion, and can get hikers lost. So by not adding to those or creating them, it's very helpful to both us as the backpackers and the land. Now, when you become more advanced, you may actually find there are areas you can backpack where there are no trails. And Leap No Trace has a lot of different things you can learn about how to hike in those places. How you're going to hike in an alpine tundra is going to be very different than a desert with cryptobiotic soil. So by learning more Leave No Trace, you can find out how to do that when the time comes. Another thing to consider is where you park, where you break, what is a durable surface? Is snow more durable than sand? These are all good questions to learn and kind of get a basic understanding of before you start backpacking. Another thing to keep in mind, which is probably one of the greatest snafus that I see for new backpackers, is the conundrum of the muddy trail. Here at Bisher, we actually close the trails when it rains too much because when too many people hike and bike it, it becomes super damaging and it destroys the trail. But maybe you're going somewhere where it's often and normally wet. It's your responsibility to plan ahead and prepare to have the right shoes and clothes to be able to walk right through that mud puddle. It seems counterintuitive, but when people constantly avoid the puddles, they widen the trails, they destroy the landscape, and it does cause vegetation damage and erosion. So just one of the many things to keep in mind when you're traveling and camping on durable surfaces. Alrighty, so this is probably one of the best compost toilets I've ever seen. This is very nice. Give it a nice nod, make sure no one's in there. Okay, it's open. And so it's pretty standard in a compost area like this. You have a toilet. When you go down underneath here, there's a big hole that's dug out. And so any of the waves just goes down below. And every so often, people will come in and help change out um, with some compostable different materials so that underneath here, it's able to just um, be recycled naturally or um, be deteriorating naturally. Um, but this is really nice. A lot of places don't have these, but this Walnut Springs Primitive Camping Area does. So that's pretty cool. The third principle we'll give you a brief explanation of is dispose of waste properly. And this means a few different things. The first thing that backpackers are automatically thinking when they're starting is, how do I use the bathroom out there in the woods? And these answers go from really easy to a little bit complicated. The number one best way is that many places here in Texas and elsewhere actually have backcountry bathrooms. These are restrooms that are designed to decompose themselves or have um, worms or something that process the waste in a natural way. So when these are available, by all means, use them. I will warn you, I've seen some pretty gnarly backcountry toilets and no matter how scary they seem, it's always best to still get your bravery up and use them because it's the what's best for the land. Now, sometimes you're gonna know that some places don't have backcountry toilets at all. And this is pretty common. So in that case, there's a few different things you can do. More and more places due to popularity 
are requiring what's called a wag bag. This is a bag that is durable and completely closes. You carry it with you your entire trip, pack it out with you. And in the meantime, you're putting any solid waste, paper and hygiene products in it. So nothing is left behind. More commonly what you'll see in places is uh, what's called a cat hole. It's exactly what it sounds like. So in this case, you're gonna to wanna to plan ahead and prepare by having a small shovel, like a garden trowel or a spade. This hikes with you at all times. When you find a camp, you want to locate a good spot for your cat hole. That's away from trails, water, other campsites and populated areas, including rivers, lakes, any water source or trail by about 200 feet. That's give or take about 70 paces. So once you pick a good inconspicuous spot that other people won't be traveling in, you dig a hole with your spade. That's about six to eight inches deep, about four to six inches wide. And you will use that, fill it back in, and then make it look as natural as possible before you leave. Now that sounds hard for most people. It's something you might need a little practice at. And there's lots of different ways to learn to do that. You might wanna just research and practice a little to find out your comfort zone. And it's always best to hike out any trash, any paper or hygiene products after you're done. Now that brings me to another subject of pet waste. It's pretty much the same, except they always use a little wag bag. Always make sure you have little pet bags with you to gather your pet's solid waste and hike it with you after completely out. Never leave it on the side of the trail for later. Now a different aspect to dispose of waste properly brings me to litter. Now here in Texas, we all know that littering of any kind is bad. Don't mess with Texas, right? But I have seen that there's some confusion on what is considered litter. For instance, backpackers may think that biodegradable items like apple cores or banana peels or food waste scraps it's okay to leave behind because it will biodegrade but that is a really big camper's myth it doesn't belong there you brought it in best rule is to pack it out banana peel can take about two years to actually decompose under circumstances that are natural so anything that you leave behind will cause damage that could mean attracting wildlife to trails or to our campsites and we'll talk more about that later but it's just a no-go you always want to pack it out with you So this leads us to number four. This principle is leave what you find. And that is exactly what it sounds like. This means that you want to leave nature as you found it. If it belongs in nature, it stays in nature as it is. So I know it's a common practice that people like to take rocks for souvenirs. They gather arrowheads or pottery shards. Some people even gather plants to press. But it's good to know that it's not only unethical to do this because it belongs where it's protected, but it is protected in most places. So in Texas state parks, being protected means it's illegal to remove any rocks, any pottery shards, any item that's naturally here, even these grasses and mosses. That being said, some places you'll travel do have special regulations that may allow you to do those things, but that's not as common as you think. So make sure you're prepared ahead of time to know and still even then consider, is it the right thing to do? Is it better fit to leave this rock where I found it? or to be in a dresser drawer for the next 10 years. It's also good to consider that in some places, items that you may not think have cultural significance do. So you may look at an arrowhead or a pottery shard and know that's culturally significant and you need to leave it. But in some places, just rocks may be culturally significant. So it's good to educate yourself and also learn to respect and understand the local cultures. So when you're thinking about leave what you find, it's not just taking things, it's manipulating things. This could mean saying no to graffiti, clawing on rocks, doing chalk on trees, carving trees with knives. These are all things I've seen over time. That double is an eyesore. We don't go into nature to see graffiti and to know that Billy was there, but it also can cause damage and make trees sick. It can even kill trees when you carve in certain trees like aspen. It can actually take out the whole colony. So it's important we understand that everything is connected and better left how it is.
And much like graffiti, another way that people tend to disturb the environment is by creating rock cairns, ahus, ducks, they're called many different things, but it boils down to stacking rocks in an unnatural pile. Now, sometimes these are used for traditional trail markers and are official, but when people build them on their own, it not only disturbs fragile ecosystems, but it can really mislead hikers and lead to some confusion. All right, we made it to the second primitive camping area, Moss Lake. I'm so excited, my hat flew off. <laughs> Let's go check these out. What we have here. Yeah, what is this? We think it's toilet paper. It's like toilet paper. There's a compost toilet up there. There's a compost toilet like right up there. Yeah. Like 100, 150 yards from here. Packing in, packing out includes your toilet paper. I can have y'all take a look at this for a second. What does this look like, y'all? Campfire time? No. <laughs> in Texas state parks, campfires in the backcountry are illegal. So making sure that you're not setting up anything like this. And, and particularly if you look here, it looks like people have been putting together some trash and different things to burn try to get it going. And now that they've left, um, that's littering as well. So not good for the environment, something we don't allow out here, especially um, in Texas because it's so dry. And um, if this area sparks, that would not be a good thing. It'd be really hard to contain. And in campsites where you can have fires, like um, just a normal campsite in a state park, you are not allowed to collect wood from the park. That is considered illegal as well. You have to bring in your own wood or buy firewood from somewhere local, but you cannot use um, dead wood that you see. You might think that it's no big deal, but um, if everybody collected the fire or dead wood around the area, there wouldn't be a lot, whole lot left. In 2017, the Texas State Park System saw 10 million visitors. And if every other visitor, so five million visitors that year, were to have taken some of this wood and used it for campfires. That would be five million pieces of wood if they were only to use one piece um, that would be getting burned and leaving the ecosystem and habitat for wildlife in those parks. So it's important that you um, leave it where it is and let it do its normal course and bring your own firewood. And Although it looks dead to you, it's pretty much the living dead because there's a lot of insects 
and critters that need dead wood to survive, to eat and as a um, protective housing. So that's why we keep it around. You've got to keep it natural. Um, and so it is illegal to also collect firewood in the park. We are going to disperse this um, so that it's not tempting for other people to do it in the future. All right, here it is after. And we um, collected what they were trying to burn, which is, looks like a McDonald's bag. So we're gonna take that with us so that we can put it in the trash can once we're off the trail. We'll see you guys a little further down. So the fifth principle for Leave No Trace is to try to minimize campfire impacts. And this one is far reaching too. So remember, this is brief. You can always learn as much as you want. Minimizing campfire impacts means we listen to Smokey Bear, right? We try to do the best we can do to treat our fire with respect and not have it cause any troubles. The first thing you want to do is find out if fires are even allowed because when you're backpacking some places don't allow them at all. They want you to use a closed fuel source for cooking like a camp stove or an MSR stove. It'd be pretty important to come prepared with the right thing so you'll actually be able to eat hot food which could be very important on the trail. So the second thing is if they do allow fires, what kind of fire? They want your fire off the ground. There's some special rules for that. Leave No Trace can help you learn. Can you gather firewood? Because in many places you can't. So it's good to know. Another thing would be if you can't have a fire, reuse a site that's already been used. Reuse a fire ring instead of creating a new one. Fire does damage the land underneath and around it. And of course, no one wants to camp where there's five fire pits all around your camp. So make sure you're reusing them any place you can. Because remember, good campsites, they're always found and not made. And they're usually already selected for their beauty, to lessen impact, and for convenience. So reusing them causes less impact on the entire land. Something else to consider with fires is something that I've seen quite often. And this is probably one of the biggest things that backpackers and regular campers do need to learn. And that's to watch what you put in your fire. You never want to burn food of any kind or trash. So for trash, that could be utensils or paper plates. Those actually do cause damage and toxins to a fire pit. So the next person to cook on it will have contaminated food. And when you burn your food, whether it's just hot dog scraps or the rest of your freeze dried meal, that stays in the ashes. And that means that it will attract animals to your campsite. They will actually eat the ash out of the fire pit. And of course that can make them sick. And it, you know, it's not good to associate humans with food and taste the ash. It means the animals come up to the campsites, which we'll talk about next. So that's a great segue into our next principle, which is respect wildlife. And wildlife is a big part of why we all travel out to experience nature. We wanna get that wildlife sighting or that photo, but sometimes there is a line you don't want to cross. I do know that sometimes people get too close when trying to get a photo or to get that more intimate experience, they actually do try to feed wildlife or touch them. It's important to understand what happens when you walk away from these situations. It does impact the wildlife's life in a deep way. When you interact with wildlife repeatedly or you do feed them by hand or even baiting them and leaving food out, it changes their behavior. This is called habituation. When animals become habituated, it can change their natural behaviors like mating and cleaning themselves, gathering food for the winter. And of course, interactions with people of any kind or baiting at campsites, even in the backcountry, leads them to campsites, getting used to people and expecting food from them, which can make them aggressive. And from an animal as small as a squirrel to something as big and scary as a bear, it still affects them negatively no matter what. And you can imagine why we want to keep bears away from campsites, but it's really no different for squirrels, even though they can't hurt us the same. Something else to consider is of course pets. When you respect wildlife, you wanna make sure you have your dog under control. Make sure there's no special regulations for your dog. A dog, especially one off the leash, can hassle, hurt, or even kill wildlife. So we wanna make sure we keep our pooches and animals safe, but also our wild animals from us.
us to our last and final leave no trace principle, number seven, which is be considerate to others. And this one is a little bit different because you'll notice when you look at all of the leave no trace principles, they're kind of all considerate to other people, but think of more specifics. When you're on a trail, you're backpacking, you have a really narrow trail that you're on and you meet a passing group, what do you do? Leave no trace can help you learn about that. What if you're on that same narrow trail and you come across pack stock, which is really very common in the backcountry? Those are gonna be horses or mules that are packing in equipment for someone. It's easy to scare those and it could be a really odd situation. So Leave No Trace can help you find out how to safely have that interaction. Also consider if you've hiked really far distance to the backcountry for peace and quiet to hear the sounds of nature and have that experience, but there's someone over there playing their music really loud on a Bluetooth speaker, you might not enjoy it, so that may be something to be conscious not to do to those around you. We all come out here in order to get something. It's usually peace, quiet, beauty, nature, refreshment. We all have the reason we come out here. So when we're considerate to others, it helps us all achieve that. When you're considerate to others, it means you're also generally being considerate to nature too, which is what Leave No Trace is all about. So that was your crash course guide to the seven principles of Leave No Trace how to be ethical outdoors, and how to be good stewards of our environment. It's good for any backpacker to learn, any outdoorsman, whether you just take your dog for a walk in the front country, or if you're fully backpacking more and more, until you become an expert, there's always more to learn with Leave No Trace. If you do wanna learn more, do go to www.lnt.org. That's LNT like leave no trace .org. On there, you can also find not only reading materials and learning materials, but you can also contact trainers like myself who work with the local community in lots of different ways to do workshops and classes to help further the understanding of our connection to the outdoors and how to do it as good as possible. You'll notice that when you care for the outdoors, it will continue to care for us. So thanks for tuning in today. And remember, if Bigfoot has been doing it for years, so can you. With our backpacking trip um, we showed you some of the backpacking trails here including the loop trail and um, we went to a couple of different primitive camping sites so we got to see some of the campgrounds that we have out there talked about leave no trace principles and we saw a couple of examples of what is not leave no trace um, and we talked about the importance of leave no trace for the environment um, and for your experience in the backcountry we got a lot of beautiful shots of the park and um, thank you for coming and joining us in Enchanted Rock and seeing some of the primitive experiences that you could have out here. See y'all next time.